Hi there, Karen here, of course, with Whiskey Sour. Hope you guys are doing great on this uh, last week before Christmas, and hope you got all your Christmas shopping wrapped up or whatever you guys uh, do for your season. Uh, I'm doing nothing. Not buying anybody presents. Not doing anything. <laughs> nothing. I'm going to make some uh, little videos like I'm doing here today just to send some of my family back home, but I'll see them in the new year. Uh, so I'm here all week. <laughs> it's like at the comedy club. I'm here all night. Uh, I, uh, I was thinking about Christmas memories today, you know, and I think about my grandma Seaver a lot because she lived with us at our farmhouse. And so uh, the farmhouse was kind of split. It was a 20 room farmhouse, very big. And the house was kind of split where grandma was living on one side of it and we were living on the other. And uh, so we spent a lot of time with grandma. She was four foot, oh gosh, four foot nine, four foot ten, really little lady. Uh, I call her my pear shaped grandma and shaped like a pear. <laughs> Everything about grandma was fruit. Uh, she uh, only had three foods that I ever saw her eat. One was toast dipped in some uh, really crappy coffee, like the coffee you'd see in the church basement. One of those crafts that looked like mud. And then there was, uh, uh, she'd eat uh, grapes, which she would patooey all over the floor. And patooey's a word. <laughs> patooey all the mold of the floor, uh, the grape seeds. And uh, then uh, she ate prunes, and she ate a lot of them. And so, you know, as I grew older, I, I realized that prunes were really good for digestion and glucosamine for arthritis and things like that. So uh, she, she only ate a few foods. If you saw her cooking in the kitchen, it was all German cuisine. You know, it's like bucket of lard in the fridge or some bacon grease french fries or something. It's just, like, not healthy. She uh, consequently died of hardening the, of the arteries, but there's only a few... <laughs> A few foods that I saw her eat from her chair, and prunes were one of them. And so I was thinking about prunes today. I thought, what a Christmas memory, prunes. So I put a big black blob picture up on my Facebook page, and everybody responded, and it was really funny. You know, some people were saying it looked like coal, you know, and some people were saying, uh, oh, what was else was on there? It was Rebecca that actually had said that it was a prune, so I thought that was pretty funny. Oh, uh, Johnny had said that it was uh, the black chakra. So there was a it's like, nope, that's just a prune. Nothing really exciting. So I thought I'd put some holly berries on it and call it the uh, holiday predator prune. Because uh, the face of it, if you look at it, looks like the predator. So um, I'm all about dried fruit over here today. <laughs> anyway, all of this caused me to think about a story I had read, so I went looking for it again. And it's by Carol McDew Reme. And I hope I'm saying her name correctly, but it's a story called A Slice of Life that I want to read to you about an orange. <laughs> so if you guys are really bored by all the fruit stuff, you can just, you know, leave now, I guess. Uh, I'm here all week. <laughs> it's like the comedy club. I'm here all night. Uh, but I want to read this story to you because I thought it was a, a story that's always made me think. Jean heaved another world-weary sigh. Tucking a strand of shiny black hair behind her ear, she frowned at the teetering tower of Christmas cards waiting to be signed. What was the point? How could she sign only one name? A couple required two, and she was just one. The legal separation from Dawn left her feeling vacant and incomplete. Maybe she would skip the cards this year. After, and the holiday decorating. <laughs> I am. No, uh, <laughs> no holiday decorating going on. Truthfully, even a tree felt like more she could manage. She had canceled out of the caroling party and the church nativity pageant. Christmas was something to be shared, and she had no one to share it with. The doorbell's insistent ring startled her. Padding to the door in her thick socks, Jean cracked it open against the frigid December night. She peered into the empty darkness of the porch. Instead of a friendly face, something she could use right about now, she found only a jaunty green gift bag perched on the railing. From whom, she wondered, and why? Under the bright kitchen light, she pulled out handfuls of shredded gold tinsel, feeling for a gift. Instead, her fingers plucked an envelope from the bottom. Tucked inside was a letter. It was a story? It read, The little boy was new to the Denmark orphanage, and Christmas was drawing just near. And so, already caught up in the tale, she settled into her kitchen chair. From the other children, he heard tales of a wondrous tree that would appear in the hall of Christmas Eve, and the scores of candles that would light its branches. He heard stories of the mysterious benefactor who made it possible every year. The little boy's eyes opened wide at the mere thought of all that splendor. The only Christmas tree he had ever seen was through the fogged window windows of other people's homes. There was even more, the children insisted. More? Oh, yes. 
Instead of the orphanage's regular fare of gruel, they would be served fragrant stew and crusty hot bread that special night. Last and best of all, the little boy learned, each of them would receive a holiday treat. He would join the line of children to get his very own. Jean turned the page. Instead of a continuation, she was startled to read, Everyone needs to celebrate Christmas, wouldn't you agree? Watch for part two. <laughs> so here she gets this, you know, beginning of a story in this bag on her porch. She refolded the paper while a faint smile teased the corner of her mouth. She wondered what somebody was up to. The next day was so busy that Jean forgot all about the story. That evening, she rushed home from work. If she hurried, she'd probably have enough time to decorate the mantle. She pulled out the box of garland, only to drop it when the doorbell rang. Opening the door, she found herself looking at a red gift bag this time, and she reached for it eagerly and pulled out a piece of paper. To get his very own orange. <laughs> That's how it continued. An orange? That's a treat? Uh, an orange of his very own. Yes, the others assured him there would be one apiece. The boy closed his eyes against the wonder of it all. A tree, candles, a filling meal, and an orange of his very own. He knew the smell tangy sweet, but only the smell. He had sniffed oranges at the merchant's stall in the marketplace. Once he had even dared to rub a single finger over the brilliant pox skin. He fancied for days that his hand still smelled of orange. <laughs> I want to go watch that thing. But to taste one, to eat one, heaven, he thought. And then the story ended abruptly, but Jean didn't mind. She knew more would follow. The next evening, she waited anxiously for the sound of her doorbell. She wasn't disappointed. This time, the embossed gold bag was heavier than the others had been. She tore into the envelope, resting on top of the tissue paper. Christmas Eve was all the children had been promised. The piney scent of fur competed with the aroma of lamb stew and homey yeast bread. Scores of candles diffused the room with golden halos. The boy watched in amazement as each child, in turn, eagerly claimed an orange and then politely said thank you. The line moved quicker and he found himself in front of the towering tree and the equally imposing headmaster. Oh, too bad, young man, too bad. But the count was in before you arrived. It seems there are no, no more oranges. Next year. Yes, next year you'll receive an orange. Broken-hearted, the orphan raced up the stairs, empty-handed to bury both his face and his tears beneath his pillow. Jean was like, wait, that's how she wanted the story to go? Oh, that wasn't how she wanted the story to go, she said. Uh, she felt the boy's pain and how alone he was. The boy felt a gentle, gentle tap on his back. He tried to still his sob. The tap became more insistent until at last he pulled his head from under the pillow. He smelled it before he saw it. It was a cloth napkin resting on the mattress. Tucked inside was a peeled orange, tangy sweet, and it was made out of segments saved from the other boys. A slice donated from each child. Together, they added up to make one whole complete fruit, an orange of his very own. Jean swiped at the tears trickling down her cheeks. From the bottom of the gift bag, she pulled out an orange, and it was a foil-covered chocolate orange. You see those things in the store? already separated into segments, and for the first time in weeks she smiled, really smiled. She set about making copies of this whole story, and she wrapped individual slices of the chocolate orange. There was Miss Potter down the street, spending her first Christmas alone in 58 years. There was Melanie down the block, facing her second round of radiation. Her running partner Jan, who was a single parent of a difficult teen. A lonely Mr. Bradford losing his eyesight, and Sue, the sole caregiver to an aging mother. A piece from her might help make one whole. So uh, I thought, how interesting. This is uh, something I don't think we do enough uh, this time of year, is think about these people who are really uh, hurting. I mean, she listed several people here who were alone for the first time in 58 years. You know, somebody obviously had lost a partner and uh, somebody going through uh, some chemo, some chemotherapy, uh, and her running partner who was a single parent of a t this teenager and this guy losing his eyesight, and somebody who is a caregiver to an aging mother. And I thought about my mother with my grandmother, uh, grandmother that ate the prunes. And my mother took care of her, even though it was her mother-in-law, you know, she took care of her in that home. So uh, I think it's important this time of year to really remember the people like that 
who are alone, who are hurting, who are working a little too hard. And it's really easy to think about the big festivities and all the gatherings. And uh, I don't think we have to uh, not do all those things as well if we are so blessed to have those things. But how long would it take us to really go buy one of those chocolate covered oranges uh, and, you know, put a, a story like that in it and just hand it out to some of those people? I think it's, uh, it's, um, it's just something we don't think about doing. And I think we should be thinking about it all year. But it's important to remember that this time of year uh, amplifies the feelings of loneliness and sadness and loss that people have. And so the reason why I believe we should be doing these things, especially this time of year, is because this time of year is so hard on people. It doesn't mean they're not alone or sad the rest of the year, and we should be thinking about that as well. But it just amplifies it. When you see other people being festive and, and things are going okay, uh, I think it's uh, that's where it just all the feelings of loss and loneliness and, and everything just are just times a hundred. And so... I thought that this story uh, about this orange was really great. And it's caused me to look at those chocolate-covered oranges differently. They're not the best tasting things in the world. <laughs> Go on, that's not the point. But uh, when I see them in the store now, I'm thinking, wow, that's a pretty cool story. And so if, uh, if you're going to give one of those oranges, wouldn't it be cool to find this story online? This Carol McDo Rayme, it's called A Slice of Life, is what I look for it you know, print out the story and maybe put that in a bag and just give it to somebody. Like, what's those oranges cost? Nothing, you know? Uh, and it just might, you know, little things like that just might make people feel a little bit better this time of year. So I uh, thought I'd share uh, this Christmas story. And I did have a really good laugh with you guys over the whole prune thing. <laughs> uh, I miss my grandma Stever a lot. She's just such a cool lady. But, uh, you know, being born in 1898, uh, I don't know how long I thought she was going to be with them. <laughs> So uh, I will leave that with you guys today and hope that this week ahead that we can, you know, constantly be reminded about the people who are hurting in our lives and if we can just extend a little bit of something like an orange, you know, to them that can go a long way and it certainly did for this lady Jean. So I will check in with you guys again tomorrow and of course until next time, and with Keith Hour and me, <laughs> rock on.